Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan, and this is a very special Zoom recording with my dear friend, colleague, and scholar, John Atak, um, author of a very important book, Opening Our Minds, Avoiding Abusive Relationships in Authoritarian Groups, must-read book. Um, this is um, a Zoom that I wanted to do on the topic of hypnosis and NLP, uh, and I asked John to participate because of his own vast knowledge, uh, but especially recently, the last uh, year or so, uh, I've been embarking on a project to write two chapters on the dark side of hypnosis for a forthcoming international handbook of clinical hypnosis. And when I was asked to do this by the editors, Julie Linden, Lauren Sugarman, and Giuseppe Di Dennis, I think I pronounced that right. Forgive me, Giuseppe, if I didn't. Um, and so I wound up asking Alan Shefflin to do the early uh, MK Ultra, Esther Brooks mm -hmm. stuff. But my the 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 chapter on the dark side of hypnosis really started and focused on Hubbard and Scientology. And John wrote a book, uh, a, a, an important tome on uh, never trust the hypnotist because Hubbard was a hypnotist. We'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to do for my listeners is, is to just state, uh, first of all, that I am a licensed mental health counselor. I do have a second master's and doctorate in organizational change and development. I'm very interested in updating the legal system on undue influence. I'm a member of the New England Society of Clinical Hypnosis, the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, and the International Society of Hypnosis. And I want to just quickly go back and say I got interested in this weird subject matter due to my own involvement with the Moonies cult. If you don't know my backstory, 19 in for two and a half years, nearly died, deprogrammed, and learn, started learning about psychology of persuasion and influence and thought reform and brainwashing and mind control and read all the literature I could find. This was 1976 when I was uh, got out of the Moonies. And it wasn't until 1980 that a, a friend of mine, Joni Lieback, a social worker said, hey, I'm going to a workshop on hypnosis. You want to come? And I was like, hypnosis, you know, tell me more. And she said, oh, there's this thing called NLP. I said, what's NLP? She said, neuro-linguistic programming. I said, what's that? She said, oh, these two uh, people, John Grinder and Richard Bandler, created a system based on the work of psychiatrist Milton Erickson. And it's a workshop on the weekend. And honestly, I was scared stiff to go to a <laughs> workshop because I had not, I've been to mm. college I had never been to a workshop, much less one on hypnosis. I was really scared and was pacing back and forth throughout the whole thing. But when I first started listening and learning to Richard Bandler, that's who was presenting this particular workshop, uh, I said to myself, this man's a psychopath. And secondly, I'm fascinated at what he's teaching because it's filling in a lot of very important gaps in my understanding of my experience getting recruited and indoctrinated into the Moonies and what I did to other people and what I learned over several years of working with other cults. I befriended Paulette Cooper and had friends who are ex-Scientologists. This was before I met uh, John Atak. I think we met John in 1989. Uh, yeah, we've only known each other and, since 1989. Only <laughs> since 1989. But I'm just giving the backstory of yeah. this whole thing. Absolutely. And um, I've recently read a book uh, by Daniel Barbin Levin, Sloanham Woods 9, about the Larry Ray cult. And he was 19 and a poetry major. <laughs> anyway, I recently reread his book and it was so well written and poetic that it's, I said to him, this really stimulated my 
poetry brain because that's what I was studying before the Moonies mm -hmm. and my switch to psychology. So I decided to do something I've not done publicly before is dig up an old poem I wrote after I met Richard Bandler. And forgive me for the bad poetry, but this was what <laughs> my thoughts were. Uh, so here it goes. Sir Richard emerged from his ghetto with a knife in his mind and a way to get even. I first saw him sounding out his jungle playpen, waiting to see the new customers' patterns behave. And behave they did. And Sir Richard certainly did perform his experiments out loud in the open behind closed minds, so he felt around for something old, almost remembered, to pull out of his bag of seven-year-old tricks. Something valuable to write about? Question mark. So that was my first. That's, my, pretty, that's that was, pretty good, Steve. That's that pretty was my good. initial oh. reaction. I got very interested in NLP uh, I, I was invited by John Grinder to move to Santa Cruz to become his apprentice. And I did the basic training, the master training. I was being trained to be a trainer. I got really into it because I had given up the idea of forcible deprogramming as a viable mm -hmm. way of influencing, uh, people in cults to reevaluate their involvement. And I was looking for a a legal, non-coercive way. And this provided me some models, which I'll describe in a minute. I got ultimately very disillusioned with NLP, which mm. I'll go into as well. One more quick poem that I read, wrote. Please, yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't put a date on it. I think it may have been a year or two later. Mm -hmm. um, into the world of mirrors, I watch myself walk into a world of altered time, shaped to words, chiseled to pictures, impressed upon feelings. I disappear when the lights go off. I become you, subject, object, give and take action. Those are references to the Moonies, by the way. Mm. A philosophy of dancing images made real enough man's possible evolution study the structure of subjective experience breathe heartbeats paste past present future where am i headed toward you moving backward forward away from me i know well enough i am not enough satisfied very good, yeah. So um, what I want to say is that what I've come to learn was that NLP was a system developed of modeling based on the work of many other brilliant people put together and packaged as a company and uh, uh, textbooks and books. My first book, I still have Frogs and the Princes, John. Yep. I think you said you even read this one. Yeah, some years Transformations, ago. Transformations, another one by Grinder and Bandler. Robert Diltz, who wrote the actual textbook on NLP. Um, and at the time, uh, Richard was married to Leslie. He divorced her around the time I was out in Santa Cruz with Orit Baryam Hassam, my first wife, Judith Delogie. Um and basically, I realized that this was an amoral a system based on doing what works, and it had mm -hmm. no values and no um, consideration of um, ethics mm -hmm. at all. And I uh, want to say for the listeners, if you don't know my influence continuum, ethical influence is informed consent and if you're going to a clinical hypnotherapist you're asking for help with a particular thing and the therapist is does no harm if they're aligning to their training and credentials and empowers the person to be independent and functional 
the unethical side is basically indoctrination and programming and installing of beliefs and making people dependent and obedient. And as we see in so many of these multi-level marketing cults, they make one course, another course, another course, and, and, and you never graduate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, they, they just keep selling you stuff. Um, and the idea isn't to like teach you stuff and say, good luck, you know, go forth. Um, so, and I, and, and, and Joni Lieback, the same woman later said, oh, I'm starting to get training, uh, with Steve Langton, who is a therapist. He wrote this book about, um, therapeutic storytelling, uh -huh. but Stephen was into NLP. He's, he's evolved over his career. He's very highly regarded he's even an editor of a, of a scientific journal on uh for clinical uh hypnosis um and so he's one of my first real teachers like legitimate mm -hmm. mental health teachers but then i wanted to learn more and the erickson foundation said you need a master's degree we don't just teach anybody and that was a big motivation for me to do my master's degree frankly because i wanted mm -hmm. to know this body of knowledge. Uh, so I started, I got my master's in 85, went to many, many workshops and conferences uh, with Jeff Zeig. And I met so many amazing people there. And I've just been learning basically for 40 years about the whole topic of hypnosis, mm -hmm. what it is, what it isn't. And I should say, when I was doing the Cult of Trump book, I contacted Steve Langton and I said, hey, Steve, I'm writing about Trump and hypnosis. I've noticed he's using some NLP patterns, which I wrote mm -hmm. about in the book. And he said, you know, I, would you be willing for me to interview you? Nope. Uh, I said, OK, well, uh, can you tell me what is the what is the definition of hypnosis? And he said, funny, you should ask me that. I did an, an issue um, and I decided to ask 18 of the top people, what is hypnosis? And I got 18 different answers. Only so 18. That, <laughs> only 18. So that was that was uh, what, five years ago or so. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to opine and tell you my take uh mm. as of 2023 march um and i have no doubt it will evolve but i'm going to you know tell you my take but i wanted to explain this because i see nlp and i see things on the internet all over the place guided meditations uh, uh visualizations all kinds of apps that are being developed and they are basically entering into this topic area mm. yeah. and so what i want to state is that we do now know neuroscientifically that hypnosis is not sleep that was one mm. of its earlier well the uh, word hypno hypnos means sleep yes uh, thank James you Braid gave it that name and, and it's wrong it's totally wrong yeah right Thank you so much. So I, I decided in this one, and maybe we'll do another one, John, with the history mm. of hypnosis. Sure. I, yeah. I want to stay on the topical thing mm. that's just rampant everywhere. Uh, I also want to comment that I was interviewed by Tristan Harris and Aza Raskin for the Center of Humane Technology. They have a podcast called Your Undivided Attention. And we talked about how technology is hypnotic, that people get into uh, doom scrolling, they lose time, mm -hmm. their attention is captured. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, that's one of the key themes about hip hypnotic uh, trance is it's a concentration of attention and it's a, a heightened suggestibility in this state of heightened concentration. Um, and so the the big, you know, my whole thing and John's too, because we're buddies and we do this work together, uh, we're about empowering people to think for themselves, to have a locus of control for their minds in their bodies. In fact, I believe we're embodied 
minds. Uh, there is no split between mind and body, which yeah. unfortunately a lot of ideologies teach. So your body's evil and your mind is good. And mm -mm -mm. we are our bodies. Mm -hmm. And if you think about uh, one of the most popular books selling is that your body keeps the score by Bessel van der Kolk, who's a, a colleague and trauma expert. It keeps selling because people are realizing I am my body and <laughs> my body remembers, you know, all these traumatic events. Okay. So with that as a frame, what I want to explain is that um, prior to Milton Erickson, the approach to hypnosis was pretty much uh, an authoritative direct suggestion using social psychology principles where the hypnotist would tell the person commands. And if the person responded to the commands, they were hypnotizable, air quotes. And if they didn't, they were not hypnotizable. Um, and so a lot of people would refuse to go into trance with a stranger because uh, they didn't trust them correctly. Um, but what Erickson uh, came along with was a process-oriented, you know, soft communications approach. And what mm. he said is that people are going into trance all day long if you just pay attention. And instead of being like present in the here and now in your body with your frontal cortex thinking and analyzing things... If you go back into a past memory, if you fantasize into the future, you're no longer in the here and now in your body. And both are very valuable things, right? Yep. But the, useful, I, yep. the idea is we want to be in charge of our own law, mind and body. And I would argue at this point, and John, I'm interested in your comments, is that we not only have a system one part of our mind. This is Daniel Kahneman and, and Amos Tversky's work, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. We have a system one, which is automated heuristics that our brain is doing predictions based off of. And then we have system two, the analytic, slower, more energy intensive part of our brain, where we're actually thinking through using logic, using knowledge of social psychology, of decision-making, et cetera, to reality test. And uh, I, we would argue that we need to be not just in our heads, but in our bodies and pay attention to our heart and our gut, you know, and many former members talk about their inner voice saying, I think it's a cult. Don't go in, go, don't go there. But then they, it gets overridden. And so they go in down the rabbit hole of a mind control cult. So um, uh, uh, that's the the basic frame I want to say. Um, so what what was valuable about NLP? So for me, if someone is an ethical therapist and they've learned NLP techniques, then they'll be teaching you the techniques, not just doing the techniques on you. And this is a major feature of my entire practice. I don't do anything uh, to people that they're not consciously aware of. And mm. I use a primary psychoeducational approach. So when people yes. think about my work deprogramming or exit counseling or just helping people to reintegrate, I'm teaching people how to control their own minds and 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 some of those processes mirror some of the things I've learned over the four decades from many of my teachers, including mm -hmm. some things that I've learned in NLP. But again, the idea is, is that uh, any system that's amoral means that you're in the, the, the hands of the practitioner. Mm -hmm. And if the practitioner uh, believes ethically, I will never do to someone else what I wouldn't want done on me or my loved ones, then you're probably in good hands. But unfortunately, most people are taught to just do it because they'll make money, they'll get free sex, uh, they'll be able to trick people and program people and slave people. 
So what else do I want to say? So one of the interesting, important things for me with, with the early days was understanding the concept of modeling. Yep. And if anything, John, it's probably the single most important thing I've learned uh, in my life because it's a framework of, for every for learning, basically. What's hmm. a model of excellence? What's a model of mediocrity or dysfunction? Hmm. And in fact, that's what psychology is all based on pathological functions and what is healthy psychology it's it's that framing and that's what i used when i wrote combating cult mind control as i interviewed just tons of people thought about my own experience and my own therapy just trying to figure out how how did they get inside my head how did they put all these crazy mm -hmm. beliefs that i would never you know choose um and so um so I learned about our senses in NLP. It says we have five senses. So we have five representational systems, a visual system, an auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory. And that if you listen to people's words and the sequence of their words, it gives you an insight into how they make sense of reality. So, so and, people will say, I see what you mean. I hear what you're saying. That feels heavy. They will, in, in words, tell you which of the systems predominates in their thinking. Yeah, Right. And the idea is that if you want to influence somebody, you need to start with the assumption they are not you. Don't mm. project your own worldview on them, but create a model in your mind of who they are and how they make sense of things so asking a person how did they you know how did they decide to purchase the last thing that they per decided to purchase well i asked my friends i looked at the different models and it felt right so mm -hmm. it was a, an auditory visual kinesthetic decision making strategy so i'm yeah. just giving little little tidbits but to understand that uh, it, it it was uh, promoted as the structure of subjective experience. Yeah, and so for me, um, figuring out a model of like, oh, how what was it that was influencing people to join? Did they have a what they thought was a spiritual experience, which was my my mm -hmm. case, or was it that they were just at a very vulnerable moment and they fell in love with their recruiter and were not interested in the group at all, but they were interested in that person? So to model what got them in and to use that as a guidance to try to predict what might help yeah. them exit. Yeah. And, and just the importance of paying attention uh, and rapport and trust building was a major thing that I learned there. Everything from breathing and um, uh, matching behavior. Somebody crosses their hands. The other person crosses their hands. They're in rapport. And if someone crosses their hands and, and their hands work folded and they uncross it, that's out of rapport. Mm -hmm. That kind of methodology I should also add that Tony Robbins learned NLP and made a deal reportedly with Bander, uh, Bandler and Grinder to not uh, mention NLP. And he's made millions and millions of dollars. Influenced and exploited a huge amount of people. <laughs> U.S. president, CEOs paid him huge amounts of money, probably still do. And I have heard from former trainers of his who've read combating cult mind control, et cetera, that they really felt like this was not a healthy uh, involvement. It is not. Yeah. Mm. So, um, but the the thing that I, I want to keep conveying to people is that um, human beings are learning biological organisms. And we like to think we're rational, but we're not. We're rationalizing. We, we're actually driven by emotions and experiences. Mm -hmm. And and so much of what our reality is, is a socially constructed reality, so that we depend on sources of information and people we perceive to be legitimate authorities to to help guide us.
Hmm. And people walk around thinking they know a lot more than they actually know. And I would say the internet is uh, to blame to a certain degree because people no longer feel like they need experts. They can just Google something, not mm. realizing that there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation mm. and people who have a credential, in fact, but are, are you know, deranged or people saying they have credentials and they have none. Mm. Uh, and I'll just do a, a comment for a minute, John, to compliment you. You don't have a college degree, but in my opinion, you have the equivalent of six PhDs because <laughs> of your scholarship. No, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding, people. Yeah. This man has read more books than me, and I read a lot of books, but but he remembers and connects things in a way that it utterly is scholarly and is really, and he's trustworthy and he has integrity, which Thank is you. really critical. So anyway. I'm going to get to you in a minute, John. I'm almost mm. finished. So no, this, is, um, this is all good. So Erickson, you know, realized that one of the most powerful techniques to change is um, confusion techniques. Mm. And how do you confuse somebody? Well, you say something congruently, like you believe it, but it's total nonsense but you say it with such certainty that you're you're in a momentary confusion state and you either say to yourself this is a confusion state <laughs> you know he's doing trying to hypnotize me mm -hmm. or you say this person's crazy and get the hell out if you choose to stay and one confusion thing after another confusion thing after another confusion thing at a certain point you're you get overloaded mm -hmm. <laughs> and so and then if you get into a behavior control information thought and emotional control the bite model feature where you're not sleeping properly and they're controlling uh, people in your environment and information in your environment and installing phobias uh then you're re then you get to the dissociative disorder part of a cult mm -hmm. identity so there's much more I can say about NLP, but I really want people to become educated consumers. Mm. And I really want people to pay attention uh, where they invest their time and their money and who they associate with to reality test whether or not these people have your best interest at heart versus you taking responsibility for your life and saying, you know what, life is precious. And yes, I may have stayed in this group for five years, but what's it going to be like in another five years or another mm. 10 years or 20 years? And what am I missing out if I continue in this mm. in this box that I'm I'm currently in? What else do I want to say? Hypnosis. I, I relied on hypnosis personally when I had a lymphoma. 16 years ago, I hired a clinical hypnotherapist during my treatment. I had uh, chemotherapy, I had surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. But one of the features when you're getting treated for cancer is you're anxious, you're fearful, you're not mm -hmm. sleeping properly. And I hired um, Max Shapiro um, uh, to do weekly sessions, record them, and I could put them on a little iPod and listen to them if I woke up in the middle of the night and it would put me back to sleep. And it was very relaxing, soothing, empowering me to know that this is just a period of time of treatment to accept the, the treatment, to know that I'm going to get healthier, to visualize my future self uh, healthy and knock on wood. Uh, it's been 16 years and I'm doing great. Um, and so, uh, I, I'm going to tell a quick story and move on. Mm, absolutely. I was getting a biopsy. I had a golf ball in my armpit, which is how it was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And Max did a, a, a session that I listened to as I was being wheeled in for to the uh, procedure. And he said things like, it's going to go very fast, minimal blood loss, the recovery is going to be extraordinary. Everyone's going to be amazed at just how, how fast you recover. So 
I have the surgical procedures, a slice in my arm, et cetera. My doctor says, go to the physical therapist. A few weeks later, I reported to the physical therapist. She said, raise your arm. And I went like this. She said, no, 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 the other arm. And I went like that. And she said, what? She said, which arm did you have the surgery on? I said, this one. She said, really? She said, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Mm -hmm. You don't need physical therapy. And it was, <laughs> so I'm just giving an example mm. um, of the power of the mind. And I, I wanted his help and I needed his help, mm. but it helped align me, you know, not in an adversarial way with my body, but a cooperative way with my body. I understood I needed sleep to help my immune system beat the cancer, et cetera. So uh, hypnotherapy is a vastly underused resource, especially in the area of chronic pain. Mm. Uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry does not want people to know about this technique that one can use on oneself to mm. dial down pain. Uh, it's really an amazing body of knowledge and research. And a shout out to Lawrence Sugarman, who has a book and I did a blog interview with Lauren Sugarman, pediatrician, uh, expert in autism, who wrote a textbook on doing hypnotherapy with children and adolescents, being a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. um, and, he, and he's written a very, very important book on the future of hypnotic techniques. So having said all of that, I want to come to the chapter which we started with and my decision to use... Um, Hubbard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll say before I met you, John, I was, I think it was uh, Vaughn Young and Stacy Young at the time and the Lisa McPherson Trust uh, and Jesse Prince. And I was down in Florida and Vaughn was telling me about TRL. And I said, TRL, what's that? Oh, it's a training routine. I said, well, what's the L? Oh, it's for lying. Oh, mm. can you please demonstrate a TR? And that opened the door for me to understand the communications course and the training routines. And I watched, and then they did a video, Jesse and Stacy did an actual video demoing mm. Some of these things. And I'm like, this is hypnosis. And they're like, it is? And, no, Hubbard said we're dehypnotizing people. I'm like, no, um, trust me, this is hypnosis. I've been, you know, trained in for a bunch of years in this. So that opened the door to Hubbard and hypnosis. And later, when I met you, John, I just, my learning exponentially increased. And then I'll just jump ahead and say you did this amazing conference and in Canada called uh, Getting Clear, was it? Getting Clear of Scientology, 2015. Getting Clear. And, and yeah. you had me up on the stage with you, and I think it was Christian Zirko, uh, therapist in the UK, and was it Chris Shelton? It was Chris Shelton's third public appearance, yes. So they pretended to be the Scientologist and the, the person getting trained, and I meta-commented, and you meta-commented, and it, people should really watch this. It's uh, available on my channel free of charge. So yeah. John Atek has a YouTube channel, and uh, uh, you should definitely check out John's um, uh, YouTube channel. We'll put this up on his channel as well. So, um, but the whole idea is close your eyes, put your feet on the floor, put your hands in your lap and just be there until the Scientologist says you pass. Hmm. And there's no way you can not go into an altered state, or as hmm. John said, there are no altered states. But for me, in that moment, from being consciously well, awake to closing your eyes and being there, there's a shift, is maybe a better way of saying it. Gonna... Well, it, it's it's just to say that there there cannot be grammatically such a thing as an altered state. There are different states. Right. You move between them. And the idea that there's an altered state presupposes that there's a proper state to be in. There isn't. There are different states of mind, and they're all right. useful. They're all things that, that we can make something of, unless, the, as you say, the locus of control goes from you to the outside, and right. you, you're 
your states of mind are being switched and moved around by somebody on the outside rather than you being in control of them. And to be fair, most of us are not in control of our states of mind and we are very easily triggered or, or moved into other states. So there are many, many states of mind. I'm going to I'm going to ask you to keep talking and talk about what what you learned. You were OT5, you were involved for many years. You never were a, a slave, you were a public Scientologist. You never joined the billionaire sea org or whatever, but you really have done your your homework and probably are the expert in the world on Scientology. Explain to our listeners what you've learned about Hubbard and hypnosis and and uh, get people interested in reading your piece, Never Trust a Hypnotist, and looking at that um, uh, demo that we all did together. But let, let's just set something in here that, that we're maybe going to have to edit what you've just said about TRL. Okay. And, and let me play back to you what my recollection is of your experience. You met me in 1989. Mm-hmm. Yep. Vaughan and Stacey Young didn't leave, didn't go public until 1993. Okay. So um, as far as I recollect, the first time you saw TRs demonstrated was by Jerry and Hannah Whitfield in 1990. And at that point, and we were in touch, you said to me that um, training routine zero is the most overt use of hypnosis by any cult that you'd seen up to that point. And so I, I, I believe no, I, I don't want to edit it because I, this is a good demonstration. Memory is not perfect. Well, and you have a better memory on this than me. And that makes sense because I, the first ex-Scientologist I remember doing a case with was, was Hannah and Jerry Whitfield. So that yeah. makes sense to me. I think that's very you know, very uh, courageous of you. I, I too do this thing where if I make a mistake in a video, I keep it in and people inevitably get into the comments. But but it is so important to point out that none of us is a perfect recording machine right. and that, you know, memory, um, the, the multiple drafts theory of memory, which is one of the things, one of the few things that Claude Daniel Dennett put forward um, in Consciousness Explained that I absolutely agree with, that every time we tell a story, we make a new memory. Mm -hmm. And so we are all the time, you know, memory is not videotape, but of course, right. video, videotape is not videotape anymore either. Memory right. is not dig digital recording. Right. Um, so, so, but, but back to the, it really was shocking to me how hypnotic mm. this, the structure of Scientology was. And it wasn't until I, I talked with you that I understood, oh no, Hubbard was a hypnotist. We found books in his library. <laughs> I'm like, tell me more, please pick it up. Yeah, surely. Um, Ron Hubbard said that he learned hypnosis when he was 16. In a book in 1951 called Science of Survival, he said, um, never believe a hypnotist. So he was a hypnotist, and he said, never believe a hypnotist. Uh, this is called a double bind. It's a standard way of, you know, Linguistic confusing. double bind, right? Yeah. And you confuse somebody, and you can, can take control of their thinking by doing it. In his first um, published book uh, on therapy, Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health, or the Mental Science of Modern Health, as I like to think of it, um, Hubbard when you go through it, and in my paper, Never Believe a Hypnotist, I went fine tooth comb through the first two years of his publications, 50 to 52. And I looked up every time he used the word hypnosis, suggestibility, trance, any of the reverie, which was a term he adopted. Hypnotists use this term to mean a light form of trance as opposed to deep trance. Um, there's a, I interviewed a guy called Don Rogers who wrote an appendix for that first book and who was on the board of all of Hubbard's foundations until 1954. And when I interviewed him, he t told me, and those interviews are published on Tony Ortega's Underground Bunker. They're available. Um, when I interviewed him, he said, well, we, I was working with Hubbard and Dr. Joe Winter and Hubbard's second and bigamous wife, Sarah. And Hubbard said um, when he got a commission to, to write a book, well, deep trans hypnosis isn't popular, so we're going to have to come up with something new. So there was absolutely zero research behind the method, which was in fact Josef Breuer's original method and the beginning of Freudian analysis. 
Mm. It was the technique that Josef Breuer used on Anna von O. And it's worth saying that it wasn't successful. Anna von O ended up in an asylum as a morphine addict, and she was put into the asylum by Josef Breuer, who had prescribed the morphine to her. Mm. So when this is claimed as the first triumph of psychoanalysis, it's nonsense. Freud himself dismissed what would become the Dianetic technique in a lecture in Worcester, Massachusetts, before the First World War. And he said the problem with the technique is that it makes you ever more dependent upon the therapist. So it has the exact opposite effect of what you want. So Hubbard, in Dianetics, Modern Science and Mental Health, when you analyze it, there are statements like, nothing in Dianetics comes from hypnosis. And then on another page, you'll read, we did a lot of hypnotic research to get to Dianetics. So again, these linguistic double binds are going on all the time. He said, um, you know, during that period, we can brainwash faster than Rush the Russians. Um, you know, total amnesia, I think it was 20 seconds. Uh, he said, we have ways here of making slaves in a lecture in 1952. He also said, you know, let's make sure none are made. But I don't think he really meant that bit. So we have a hypnotist. He did it in reality. It, I, I think there's no doubt that, that Scientology is the most extreme form of mind control ever devised. Um, it takes, I mean, Conway and Siegelman in Snapping called Scientology the most debilitating set of rituals in any cult in America. And they said, you know, with the Moonies or Krishnas, there'd be a kind of natural um, release from the group. So that three to six months afterwards, you know, you wouldn't be thinking that way anymore. But with Scientology, they said it would probably be more like 12 and a half years. Right. And when I, I was in touch with them, that was in 1990. I was in touch with them about five or six years ago. And I said, uh, that was a guess, wasn't it? The 12 and a half years. It's more likely that if you've been in Scientology without help, you'll never recover. And they said, yes. That, no, that was and, now. and you and I both know people who've been in 40 years or whatever, and they still are walking around with programmed beliefs and language and practices from the cult. Yeah, and, and they're it's, out of the cult. The cult hasn't left their their brains, their minds. And, and this is about environmental re reinforcement that, as was shown by Robert J. Lifton, the brilliant Robert J. Lifton, your good friend, that with people who'd been through the Chinese thought reform program, about which we must talk later at great in great length, because I've been doing a lot of work on that. But he found that 24 of the 25 people he interviewed no longer believed the things they'd been brainwashed into. And from there, people go, oh, so brainwashing doesn't work. Ah, well, look at China. <laughs> uh, the horrible documentary, One Child Nation, which is about the, yeah, it, it, one of the, the most awful things I've ever seen. Um, you know, the, well, we'll go into the details. Yeah, we're going to need to, well, let's to sort of wrap the viewers, this up in but, a few more minutes, but, but yes. But the point is that, that where women were interviewed who had enforced sterilization, tubal ligation, having had a child. Years later, they're being interviewed and they're saying, yes, but it was necessary for, for China. Now, now we, we know that it's not necessary, that if you create an economic situation where people can survive, the birth rate goes down. So you don't have to you know, sterilize your population. Right. But it shows that within the environment of China, the reinforcement exists to maintain this way of thinking. Right. And... So what Hubbard discovered, which makes Scientology rather different from most groups, is how to get you to reinforce the condition in yourself. Right. And one part of that is the training routine zero, that you are taught to have locked on eye contact with everybody you talk to. Now, elsewhere in the military and the police, this is called the predator stare. It is intimidating to people to be stared at. Scientology, Scientology subject to you using the word stare, locked on eye contact is confronting the person. I don't think people like to be confronted all the time either. I learned this. I had nine years of doing this. Uh, as you say, I was not a live-in member, but I had this technique. And it took me six months after I left to stop doing it. And the amazing thing for me was realizing that I now observed so much more than I had done when I was having to keep this locked on eye contact. That is the first way that the reinforcement works. Yeah, you and if I may on. connect the dots with hypnosis, 
one of the most common early uh, induction techniques is called the eye fixation technique, where the hypnotist says, pick a spot on the wall, mm -hmm. keep staring at it. Don't let your eyes deviate. Just keep focusing in more and more and more. And that I, I think our eyes are created to scan, not to mm -hmm. stare. But in the case of Scientologists, your opposite a cult member who already has a pseudo identity, hypnotically programmed identity, mm -hmm. and you're staring into each other's eyes and you're not supposed to react. You're just mm -hmm. supposed to stare. And, you, and that, then that becomes your normal everyday way of being. So eventually when you've done the drill and you, you're meant to do the drill for some hours the first time you do it. Yep. I did it every day for the first nine months I was involved. Mm -hmm. And so it was just natural to me. And right. and when you treat with Scientologists, they're doing that. So that's part of the way that it, it stays in. And other parties, as you say, the language will often remain. Right. And Scientology has the most elaborate loaded language of any group. You have two 600-page dictionaries of Hubbard's words. And so... People start to think within the concepts of that of that language, and they may actually prune off the language, but they'll still retain the concepts. And those concepts will guide the way they behave, uh, because our beliefs dictate how we behave. And so they'll they won't really examine the the concepts. So the idea, for example, of what in Scientology is called the overt motivator sequence, where you an overt is something you do wrong. A motivator is your justification for having done it wrong. Something was done to you. He did it first. You know, that kind of thing. Now, this, the overt motivator sequence, will become karma. And rather than studying Hindu or Buddhist texts on karma, they'll just keep believing it. They will believe in the past lives, an expression that Hubbard borrowed, borrowed as with much else from Alistair Crowley. And they won't realize that to a Hindu or a Buddhist, past lives is a bad thing. The idea of reincarnation is you're on the wheel of suffering for the Buddhists and you're trying to escape from this to right. you know, become part of Paramatman if you're a Hindu, part of the great soul. Mm -hmm. So Scientology is pointed the other direction and people keep believing these things without applying thought to them, which is right. the important part of, the, of how to break the enchantment that you become capable of questioning and capable of, of saying, well, actually, this thing that Hubbard said is nonsense. You know, right. it's not true. So if I may just add for our listeners, um, I believe uh, the term is study tech. You uh, the talked study about technology. the, the yeah. two dictionaries. So uh, my understanding is if you if you get confused or don't agree with something you're being re reading or something being done to you in Scientology, it means you've passed a word you don't understand. Mm. So you have to look it up. And, and that's, again, you're indoctrinating yourself with his words and his thoughts that are black and white, all or nothing, good versus evil, us versus them mm -hmm. in the strict. And he's source with a capital S. So he mm -hmm. there's no one who knows more than uh, the pathological liar, bigamist, you know, cult leader, Ron Hubbard. Yeah. So I just and wanted to explain you are absolutely right. And and we keep you and I keep meeting former members and they're using the words of Scientology hmm. and the concepts. And that's still, still. Yeah. I mean, we've both both talked with Aaron Smith Levin, who who I think he's great. I really like Aaron a great deal. And, you know, he's a great personality. But I was quite shocked when I, I talked with him and the, you know, the video is up on my channel because he when I asked him about recovery, he, he didn't know what I was talking about. And then, so he then said that he thought there were good ideas in Scientology. And, and I sort of said, well, could you name one of them? And he said, yes, the ARC triangle, affinity, reality, communication, equal understanding. If you raise any aspect of, of them, so you communicate more, you'll have more affinity. And so I said, but shouting at somebody, shooting somebody, these are forms of communication that won't raise affinity. It's, it's such an easy construction to pull apart. Uh, but it was interesting that, that he was actually saying, you know, he wants to share these ideas with other people. He just doesn't want to use the words that Hubbard used. So undercutting it and saying, actually, Hubbard's ideas are, for the most part, nonsensical. And where they're not nonsensical, they're plagiarized, which I, I wrote Great a paper point. 
Yeah, he stole a lot. Listen, um, I know that we can talk for days. Uh, I certainly can listen to you for days uh, with your scholarship. Um, but I want to uh, just ask you to to just summarize for our listeners the connection. Now, you've been helping people get out for decades um, about hypnosis and NLP. Just give us your take on what I said earlier and where you're at. And if you disagree with anything, please share. Yeah, well, my I, I, I read Frogs into Princes. I, I left Scientology in 83. I read Frogs into Princes in 84. And it was one of the books that showed me that I'd been taught a very elaborate system of hypnosis. And you and I, our paths have been very different because I sort of went, I want to understand hypnosis so that I don't do it. And the point where we meet is is saying we want people to understand what it is so that they can have control over their own states of mind right. rather than being manipulated from the outside. And your approach, uh, in fact, I think it was combating cult mind control that I first got the idea from, your approach is, is process counselling so that you understand what processes the person has been put through and you help to bring them back out of those processes my approach has always been information but i understand that you first of all have to establish a rapport with the person but i don't do that by pacing their breathing or their gestures or, or any of that nor, nor of i no it's thing it's something we've gone i past did now. 40 years ago <laughs> yeah. i was first being trained in it but i i just am naturally being me I've... Exactly. And I think that 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 being authentic with people, being absolutely genuine in who you are with them, and also being um constantly empathetic in you know, in this in a counseling situation, not you know, right. not necessarily behaving as a therapist in all of your life. Oh, definitely but, not. But when you're dealing with somebody who has a terrible problem and you're trying to help them, and that particular problem is that they've been enchanted and trapped into a system which has the, the states of mind here become very important because in hypnotherapy, in whatever its form, even if it's Scientology, the aim of Scientology in almost all of its procedures, and there are more than 2,000 procedures in Scientology, is to bring about a state of very good indicators. That's what Hubbard calls it, redefining everything as he goes. The rest of us call that euphoria. You know, hey, I feel great. That is a point where you're rationality diminishes when we get high we are not you know calculation is cool analysis is is cool it so the idea is to excite you to a point where you go i want this experience again mm -hmm. and so in scientology and many other groups you have people chasing after like junkies you know, talking with people who've been in transcendental meditation who spent 12 hours a day meditating because of the bliss state they abandoned their kids they didn't do their job you know they didn't put food on right. the table but but they were blissed out and so you have that thing of wanting that state of consciousness mm. uh which is very useful to us some of the time mm -hmm. um with Scientology as you say with fixation of attention it induces a state of mind I think that uh, part of that is the feedback system that's in in the brain. So if you sit in a dark room for 10 minutes, you will start to hear things and you will sense movement in the environment mm -hmm. around you. And I think it's the sensitivity of the brain turning up. And I think if you when you stare at something, you get the Gansfeld effect where there'll be kind of shimmering colors and things. This is why mindfulness and meditation forms, we need to understand what's happening neurologically in these right. states rather than believing that they're transcendent spiritual states that they're right. actually physiological states in Scientology you have so many procedures uh, for example um there are what are called control communication havingness uh, or objective processes where you will mimic what another person is doing so they'll raise a book and move it and you will try and follow their movement so you're actually pacing the person and coming under control yeah hubbard in in terms of his reference to, to hypnosis there is no doubt in um never believe a hypnotist 
I give reference to textbooks that he recommended in the early um, right. Hypnotism Comes of Age, for example, by Wolf and Rosenthal, which when you go and read them, and he says that Scientologists should read these things, but he says it in obscure lectures. So I'd, I've never met a Scientologist who read 25 lessons in hypnotism or, or you know, the various Except other yourself. Books. Yeah, I've, I've met ex-members who, who dug them out. But yeah. the, the books that he recommended on intelligence, which are pretty nasty, Black Boomerang, for example, or The Spy and His Masters, when you go and look at what he was reading, you find out where his techniques came from. But you also find that he'd inverted it mm. to pretend that it would be good for you to be enslaved to him. So you you said before, and let me amplify this, he, he was the only person who could know anything. He wasn't just the person who knew the most. Nobody else is capable of discovering technology and that understanding of the mind. His was the only system in 50,000 years, according to his book, Fundamentals of Thought. And so he elevates himself to this godlike status. And you have this conundrum, this paradox in Scientology. You're being told that by studying Scientology, you will become completely self-determined. And you'll become completely self-determined when you agree with everything that Hubbard says. <laughs> <laughs> which is impossible because he contradicts himself all over the place. Yeah. So, you know, you've got this trap set up. Yeah. So I'm going to need to, we're going to need to wrap up, but I just need to play devil's advocate and fun mm -hmm. with you and say that, no, my former cult leader was the greatest man in human history, 10 he times a, greater than Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad or anybody. He was a true he father. Was sinless and he was true father. And he knew every, he could look at you and know everything about 10 generations of your ancestors and mm -hmm. in the future and all kinds of other crap. So um, that just needed to add in. He, he was he was also as a sinless man convicted of rape, of course, and well, managed to buy the I don't know that he was convicted, but he certainly raped a lot of women, had children out of wedlock, and mm -hmm. and there's so much more to say. Listen, mm -hmm. so we're just going to wrap up and say um, it's your mind. You should control it. The locus of control should be in you. You need to exercise your critical reality testing thinking you need to look at legitimate credible experts and sources but never trust them blindly mm -hmm. ask questions as as uh you know legitimate experts will say i don't know or i don't remember uh or i made a mistake forgive mm -hmm. me and yeah. i made a mistake john for and thank you very much for pointing it out. Real friends will say that to you mm. and not just, you know, skirt around things. Mm. Um, check out John Atak's book, Opening Our Minds. Check out his channel. And we have a lot of work to do to help uh, raise civilizations around the world from authoritarian mind control, because that's what seems to be happening and people are walking around in confusion and disorientation and anxiety and stress. And the leadership are, are, do not understand these, what is a PSYOP? What is information warfare? How do we protect our, our citizens? How can we uh, agree in a way that's going to ensure planetary survival? And, um, and I, you know, I think very strongly after decades of thinking about this problem we are not going to resolve our environmental problems as long as we keep fighting wars and those wars are both on the ground like the one in ukraine at the moment but also in the mind and the only way to overcome that mindset is by helping people to think for themselves and that means overcoming the authoritarian barriers in their own mind where they're saying well i'll, I'll believe in him because i don't know what to do and on the other hand the I, I have a sense of certainty. I have feelings of certainty, confusing evidence with what you want to believe. And and so and the, the other thing which which we touched on is any system that is not allied with an ethical code. Mindfulness, for example, uh, Daniel Goldman has recently reiterated what John Kabat-Zinn said. You don't you can just um, by meditating, you will achieve compassion. 
the Japanese military meditated we're, every day. So yep, you have we're to have gonna need code. to go. Um, for afraid I have another commitment. Thank you so much. You're the Thank man. You. And yep. we'll we'll be in touch soon. Thanks. Always great. Okay, Cheers, Steve. Bye.